My slide today is based on a, a Medium post by Brian Armstrong, so all just about everything in the slides here, full credit to Brian Armstrong, the CEO of uh, Coinbase.com, one of the very first Bitcoin startups. Uh, and we'll start off getting, by getting right to the point, right? It's words from Brian Armstrong, and I agree completely. Digital currency may be the most effective way the world has ever seen to increase economic freedom. If this happens, the implications are profound. It could lift many countries out of poverty, improve the lives of billions of people, and accelerate the pace of innovation in the world. And in the last panel, and a lot of the speakers today, we've already heard people talking about permissionless ledgers, and permissionless this, and distributed that, but we need to keep our eye on the ball. Why, why is a permissionless ledger cool? Why is that interesting? It's because it brings more economic freedom to the world. So let's talk about what that is, right? What is economic freedom? Economic freedom is a measure of how easy it is for members of a society to participate in an economy. It has a number of factors, such as how easy it is to start a business, whether property rights were enforced, free trade with people in other nations, regulation of labor and business, and the stability of the currency. And if we stop and think about that for a minute, Bitcoin and digital currencies make all of these so much easier. Before Bitcoin, if you wanted to start a business and accept payments from somebody else in another country or even another town next over, you'd have to get permission from your local bank or from PayPal or from a credit card processor and they'd have to get permission from the local government. If it's an international business, you'd have to get permission from both governments and banks in all these countries and there's all these intermediaries along the way that everybody has to get permission from. But Bitcoin allows permissionless commerce and permissionless innovation and that's a big giant step towards economic freedom. Uh, and with Bitcoin, the math is what controls who owns which bitcoins. The, the property rights are enforced by mathematics, right? One of the fundamental laws of the universe, right? We don't have to depend on a bunch of old men in, in suits working in some building with a flag out in front to enforce our property rights. With bitcoin, it's built right into the protocol, and you don't have to trust anyone at all other than the laws of mathematics. And again, for anybody that's used PayPal or credit cards or tried to accept international payments, when you install a Bitcoin wallet for the first time and see how easy it is right before your eyes to send and receive payments with somebody else, it's, it's like magic. It really is a magical experience when you see just how easy it is. And that's going to bring more economic freedom to the entire world. And it allows people, uh, whether in you know, so-called free countries or in uh, oppressive countries, you can start a business right now today with Bitcoin. Why is that important, right? Here, let's look at some of the economic uh, freedom rankings of different countries around the world. So we have on the, you know, the more economic free countries, we have Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, Chile, Ireland, Estonia, UK, and US. All places that are known to be pretty decent places to live, right? People have a high standard of living, it's a nice place to live. If you look at the least economically free countries, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, on and on and on, and if you look at the list of countries on the right that are less economically free versus the companies on the left, or the countries on the left, it's pretty clear which set of countries you would rather live in and spend your life and raise your family. And it's not just a coincidence, I, don't, I will argue later. And here's an example, right? Havana, Cuba in the, in the 50s versus today, not all that different, but look at how far Hong Kong came. And it, the top of the slide's cut off a little bit, but uh, the top pictures are Hong Kong. Uh, there, it came from from nothing to uh, you know a world class city overnight, and they're both you know little islands. Cuba, if anything, is you know a much bigger island than Hong Kong, but it was just uh, different economic policies, more economic freedom in Hong Kong. So why is economic freedom so important? Because it leads to a higher per capita income, higher life expectancy, higher literacy rates, more income for the poorest ten percent of the population, improved environmental protection fewer wars and violent conflicts, higher self-reported happiness of citizens, less corruption and bribery, right? Economic freedom brings all those things. Who, who doesn't want all of those things in their life? And uh, again, we have uh, a list of the income level for the poorest 10%. If you want to help the poor around the world, the best way to help the poorest people around the world is through more economic freedom. So the green on this chart is the most economically free uh, group of countries and the red is the least economically free group of countries. And if you look at it, 
the countries with the most economic freedom have the highest income level for the poorest uh, 10%. And again, for income per capita as a whole, the most economically free countries have way more income per capita for everybody. And I, from the most economically free to a little bit less economically free to medium to not so much to not at all, look at it. It's, it's, it's plain as day right there before your face. And Bitcoin helps bring more economic freedom to the whole world. So if you want more uh, income per capita, Bitcoin's a good way to help that come to the world. Uh, if you want more, uh, more people to be able to read, right? So you can read and understand this sort of thing. There's some correlation between economic freedom and literacy rates as well, plain as day in the, in the chart there. Life expectancy, right? Nobody here wants to die. If you want to die, you would have already committed suicide and you wouldn't be here at the talk. So that's proof that all of you guys want to live. If you want to live longer, you're likely to have a longer lifespan in an economically free country than an economically unfree country. And once again, the, cor the correlation here or, or is, is plain as day. Unemployment rates, right? Everybody wants to have a job and have income. Unemployment rates are the lowest in the most economically free countries. The more economic freedom uh, a country has or a place or area has, the easier it is for anybody to get a job. Uh, and the more economically unfree the country is, the harder it is to get a job, so the more unemployment you'll have. And again, look at, look at the, co the, the, the correlation here. It's just incredible. Infant mor mortality, right? Everybody loves babies. Nobody wants to see babies die. If you want more babies to live through childbirth, the economically free countries are the place where you should have your children. Because look at this, I mean, what, a, what a drastic difference. And the more economic freedom a country has, the more babies are going to survive childbirth. And there's not too many people in the world that aren't in favor of more babies uh, surviving childbirth. Children in the labor force, right? Lots of people are appalled by the fact that children have to work you know, from you know, a very, very young age. It's in the economically unfree countries where you, know, you see these four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids having to work 40, 60, 70 hour weeks. Uh, if you want kids to not have to work in the labor force from a very, very young age, economic freedom helps with that as well. And it's worth pointing out the correlation does not prove causation. But when we see example after example after example in both theory and in practice, where greater economic freedom leads to better results for the rich and poor alike, I think some very strong inferences can be made. And that's why I'm so excited about Bitcoin, because long before Bitcoin had ever been invented, my hobby was studying economics, and specifically about how the more economically free a country is, the higher the standard of living everybody in that country is. And if you take a look around, for those of us that are old enough to remember before the Berlin Wall came down, East Germany and West Germany is a wonderful example. You had the same culture, the same you know, natural resources, just two different forms of the government controlling the economy. And in West Germany, you had much more economic freedom than in East Germany. And in West Germany, people had a much higher standard of living. They were producing Porsches and Mercedes and BMWs and exporting them all over the world. And people, for the most part, had a pretty good standard of living. And in East Germany, you had much less economic freedom. They weren't producing Porsches and Mercedes and BMWs and Audis. They were producing a great big giant wall to prevent people from escaping because things were so bad there. And that's a real world example right before our eyes of where we can see economic freedom makes everybody better off. Another example that's still in existence today is North Korea versus South Korea, right? Koreans on both sides of that border on South Korea, you have a much higher degree of economic freedom and you have you know, Samsung and LG and all these amazing electronics and cool things and I can't think of anything they've produced other in North Korea other than a police state to prevent people from being able to escape. Uh, so clearly economic freedom, you want to live in an economically freer country than a less free country. And Bitcoin helps that for not just one specific country. Bitcoin helps bring additional economic freedom to every single person on the planet. And it does it by making it easier to start a business. It makes it so your property rights in your Bitcoin are easily enforceable via the laws of mathematics, not the laws of some politicians who you've never met. It promotes free trade. You can do business with anyone anywhere in the world right now today with Bitcoin. 
It enables freedom of contract, right? You can, people, smart contracts are on the rage. People are talking about that all the time, but uh, it allows people to, to have their contracts and choose an arbiter of their, so, their choice anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what jurisdiction they happen to physically be in. Uh, and it enables people to opt out of corrupt systems, right? If you don't like what's going on in your local area, just use Bitcoin instead. So if we can create more economic freedom in the world, it will serve as a giant economic stimulus package for the world, accelerate innovation, reduce wars, make the poorest 10% better off, overthrow corrupt governments, and raise happiness. And that's a quote from Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, who is one of the very, very earliest Bitcoin companies uh, in the world. And I remember meeting Brian for the first time at a barbecue in Silicon Valley in 2011. A lot of people might not realize that uh, long, long ago, blockchain.info and Coinbase were actually one company in the early, early days. Um, and the people that got involved in Bitcoin at that time, myself and Brian and lots and lots of others included, we saw this vision of Bitcoin bringing more economic freedom to the entire world. And we knew we wanted to drop whatever it was we were working on before Bitcoin and work on Bitcoin full time to help bring this amazingly powerful tool to help improve the, the lives of every single human being on the planet. Um, so Bitcoin, and, and this is a quote for me because I think it's true, I had to put it in there. Bitcoin and digital currencies are the best tools the world has ever seen to accomplish these goals. So let's step back and think about that for a moment. You know, society's been civilized for a few thousand years at this point. Technology's gotten better. People have more freedom than they, they, they have in the past. But now we have this tool of Bitcoin that suddenly puts every single human being on the planet on even financial footing with everybody else. They now have the ability to interact with anyone else anywhere in the planet without requiring permission from somebody else. Something like that has never existed in the entire history of the world until the invention of Bitcoin. And that's going to help enable all of these wonderful traits that we just went over a moment ago. So if these ideas excite you and you think economic freedom is a good thing and less babies dying at childbirth are, is a good thing and the poorest 10% having more money and you having more money and the entire world's rate of economic growth being faster than it is today, if you like all those things, get started with Bitcoin today. Tell your friends, tell your family, set up Bitcoin wallets for them, install the apps, show them how to work it, tell them about purse.io where they can save 15 or 20% on amazon.com. If you want the entire world's rate of progress and the entire standard of humankind's living standard to increase at a faster rate than it's increasing today, Bitcoin is the very best tool we have to do that uh, until AI comes around because then that will also change things a bit. Uh, anyhow, that's me. I'm Roger Veer. These are some of the com com uh, companies I invested in because uh, I want to see these uh, positive changes come to the world sooner rather than later. I think I probably have a few minutes left for questions, uh, so don't be shy. I have five minutes left, so if anybody has any questions or topics you want me to address, put your hand right up, and uh, I'm happy to address them. So, and I see uh, this guy right here with a... So his, his question is, how is rootstock coming out going to affect uh, Ethereum and everything else? Uh, that's probably a better question for Sergio than myself. <laughs> um, although, at this point, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people haven't given too much thought to yet is that we're kind of, Bitcoin was the first, but now we're kind of seeing an evolution of cryptocurrencies and there's thousands of these now and they're all competing against each other in, in a bit of a Darwinian evolution of cryptocurrencies. And so Bitcoin has the, the lead and is the king of the hill and it has this giant network effect that'll be really, really hard to overcome. But you know, once upon a time, T-Rex was the king of the world and it didn't seem like anything could overcome that. And so Bitcoin's not guaranteed to be the winner in the end, but the more stuff that's built upon Bitcoin and the more stuff that happens with it, the more that its top dog position is cemented in, but it's not guaranteed to win in the end. So uh, that's my long-winded answer to a, a question that I don't have much of an answer to, so. So I, I think the, the short version of the question is, what, what are my biggest concerns in regards to Bitcoin? Uh, and I think at this point, my two biggest concerns in regards to Bitcoin, not to open too big of a can of worms, are scalability. 
Uh, and then privacy. I think uh, the privacy aspects of Bitcoin have been ignored a bit recently. In the early days of Bitcoin, everybody assumed that Bitcoin was much, much, much more private than we now know that it is today. Bitcoin's not nearly as private as it should be and needs to be. And uh, a lot of regula regulators or bankers or those sorts of people, they think, oh, you can't have some private currency. But if you think about it, one of the characteristics that make something money is fungibility. And fungibility is just another word for privacy. So the, if you want to have something that works well as money, it has to be fungible. And in order for something to be fungible, it has to be private. So uh, that's an inherent characteristic of money that Bitcoin needs to improve upon in the future. So those are the two things that I'm the most concerned about. So and right here in the front. So the question is, uh, why is Ripple listed on there? So I invested in Ripple in 2012, I think it was, when Bitcoin was about $2. And uh, at that point, we didn't even know what Ripple was going to be. The I put up the initial seed money, basically, to start Ripple. And the initial idea at the time was that it would be just like Bitcoin, but without the same proof-of-work system. It would have a different consensus uh, mechanism. And then lately, it's transitioned to uh, something for banks. And I I'm not even really too sure about what they're up to at the moment, to be honest, because I've been focusing all my time on Bitcoin, so, uh, and I haven't updated the final page of my slide for several years either, so that's why it's still listed there, but uh, more power to Ripple, you know, the more things we're trying around the world, the more likely we're going to have, you know, new and cool things that everybody gets to use, and I apologize, I think that's the end of my time, but I'm here uh, until Friday, actually, the conference isn't happening on Friday, but, or Thursday, but uh, I'm here all day today, all day tomorrow, uh, feel free to, to pull me aside, and I'm happy to talk to any and all of you. Thank you all so much for getting involved. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know about Bitcoin. Thank you.